So this is our very first um, recorded remote men's Bible study, but we've got some girls here and that's okay. Not a big deal um, because this is not a lesson that's directed to men. We're just studying the gospel of John, which is for everybody. So, hey, Pete, you got some background noise. Would you mind muting? Um, how do I do that? <laughs> I'm on my phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, there should be a mute button on the app. Or if you've caught, because you didn't call in, you've, you're you using the Zoom app? Yep. There should be a mute button on there. Tap on the screen and see if a mute button appears. Yep. Perfect. All right. Thanks. But if you, if you want to answer a question, you just unmute, not a big deal. So uh, we're just going to be in the gospel of John chapter two, at which point I should hear some cheering and clapping and applauding because this is our seventh week and we finally made it to chapter two. So uh, we'll do what we always do here. I'm Mr. Scott and y'all have to forgive me. My handwriting on this drawing tablet is not what it is in class. <laughs> and we're going to be in John chapter two and We've, we've finished up John chapter one, which included the prologue. It included uh, the testimonies of John the Baptist. And what did we talk about last week? Who can remember what we talked about last week? The calling of the disciples. Calling, the first calling of the disciples. And let's just list them because this is kind of give us, going to give us a little bit of context for what we're going to do in John chapter 2, what are the names of the disciples that met Jesus for the first time? Philip. Philip's one. Good. Nathaniel. Philip went and told Nathaniel. And then Andrew. Andrew's one. And Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Mm -hmm. And who was with Andrew? When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, and two disciples went, and Andrew was one of them, and who was the other? Uh, we assume John. Right. Probably John. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna write probably. Which which makes sense because he's the guy writing this, and he's writing this from a, a personal eyewitness account. <clears throat> and and so when we finished up, that was the first four days, and then we're gonna start in John chapter two. And before we read, what I'd like to do is pray, and then we'll read this first section of John chapter 2. We'll, we'll read about the wedding at Cana, and then we'll just dive in and see where it goes. So y'all bow with me. We're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is a special thing. This is, um, these are some strange circumstances that we find ourselves in, where all public activities at church are just canceled and postponed until later. But we know that you, that doesn't mean that you want us to stop dwelling in your word. That doesn't mean that you want us to stop preaching your gospel. Um, that we don't put our Christian lives on hold because this is the case. We're going to protect our families and stay at home when we can. But Lord, you've given us an opportunity here to spend time in the word together remotely. And that's a really great thing. That's a, that's a God thing. That's something that you can accomplish. Something that you've ordained. And we praise you for that. And so I pray that you would bless this time, that you would help us to use this time wisely as we study your word, that you would help us to understand the deep things of scripture that are spiritual, that our flesh cannot understand by nature. So Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to understand what we're going to learn today in the gospel of John. I pray that you would put us in that, that mindset that we'll be looking towards heavenly things, instead of being distracted by earthly things. And Lord, I know that this technology stack is a little weird, and some may come later, and some may not make it at all, but I pray that, um, that you would continue to bring them in, and that we're recording this, so I pray that they get to watch it later, so that your, your word would still bring you glory. And I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Sweet. So we're in John chapter 2, and... Um, normally we just go around the room and read. Now I have learned from, 
from practice because I've been doing remote lessons like this at work that you can't just go around the Zoom room and read because nobody knows who's supposed to read next. <laughs> so uh, it works better if I just call on you by name and then you read that portion. So that's how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to be in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Um, so there's, there's sort of three paragraphs there. And Dad, Dad, are you willing to read at the moment? Or are you still eating? I'm going to take that as he's still eating. <laughs> I, I had to find the unmute button. When I talked Sunday, I didn't have to worry about my mute button. Yeah, you just um, talked. So you want me to take the first paragraph? The first um, five verses? You can if you want, if you're available. I want you to tell me what you want. All right, Dad, you read verses one through five. By the way, that's my dad. Wave, Dad. Hey, guys. And I'll, I'll, I'll wave at you all in a minute when I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, dad, you read verses one through five of John chapter two. Ben, if you could read six through, uh, let's see, there's a turning point here. You read six through eight. Pete, if you could read for me nine through 12. <clears throat> sure will. All right, here we go. Uh, John 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus, was, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did. All right, Pete, it's your turn. Okay. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the, through the servants, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone bring out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now this is the first of the his miracle miraculous signs jesus performed at cana in galilee he thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him Go ahead and read 12, too. 12. Uh, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brother and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Very good. So here, our setting has changed. So in, in verses 19 through the end of chapter 1, we were at a place called Bethany on the Jordan River. And so there's a sea here and the Jordan River here, and there's a town called Bethany. And remember at the, in, in the last section of chapter one, it said Jesus decided to go to Galilee. So here's Galilee. And there's a couple of towns here that are important to our story. One is Cana. That's where they end up. There's another one called Nazareth. And we know a guy named Jesus who is from Nazareth. And, and so one thing for us to note, first of all, is that Nathaniel was from Cana. This was his hometown. Um, Simon and Andrew and Philip were from Bethsaida. Nathaniel was from Cana. Jesus was from Nazareth. Jesus has now gathered his disciples at the end of chapter one, and he set out for Galilee, and somewhere along that way, he received an invitation to a wedding. Now, um, some things to note here. 
It says that the mother of Jesus was there. Now, who's the mother of Jesus? Mary. Uh, see, I'm softballing them in here so that we, we can do our, our good Sunday school answers. Okay. We're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, her husband, Joseph, is not mentioned in this narrative at all. In fact, we don't hear of him uh, except for the fact that he's Jesus, son of Joseph. We don't see him in this narrative. When we get to verse 12, it said, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. So it's possible that Joseph has already passed away before we get to this point in Jesus' life, that all he has left is his mother and his brothers and sisters. So Jesus has now gone into Galilee and received an invitation to a wedding, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now the wording here, the very first words here in John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, on the third day. Now we've been going through in this uh, part of John chapter one, almost day by day, as John is recounting the steps leading up to himself, personally meeting Christ. In verse 12, it talks about the testimony of John. Then on 29, it says the next day. 35, it says the next day. Verse 43, it says the next day. So at the end of John chapter one, we're four days in. And then this says on the third day. So I, I saw a lot of disagreement in the commentators about, well, which day is that? Is this like a third day of the wedding, the third day after John's first testimony, the third day after the fourth day that was mentioned? It's likely to, I think, the third day after the fourth, which means we've now covered the whole first week of Christ's ministry here. And on this third day, he arrives at a wedding, and the mother of Jesus was already there. And Jesus was invited to the wedding, and so were his disciples. Now, it's probably unlikely that when the wedding planner was preparing for the wedding and sending out invitations, that he knew Jesus was going to invite five guys to come with him to Galilee. So this was probably like, a, oh, oh, you're a rabbi, and you've got disciples that are following you. I tell you what, just bring them. Not a big deal. Just bring them. It's fine. So something for us to note here, we're three days into a wedding, and it's not uncommon in that day for Jewish weddings to have, this is wedding, not winter. I don't know where that came from. Into a wedding. It's not uncommon for Jewish weddings to last seven days. So we're three days in and we've invited now too many people that we had previously planned for and something bad happens. What's the bad thing that happens? <clears throat> By the way, I see you, Billow. I saw you connect. <laughs> yeah, I made it. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can see you and hear you. I, I can hear you. Right, I can hear right. you. So, yeah, chime in if you know the answer. What bad thing has happened? The wedding's not over yet. They ran out of wine. We ran out of wine. Okay, now, some things to note here. Jewish weddings and, and the, um, this, this was sort of like a seven-day feast and it would have been run by, arranged by, paid for by the bridegroom. The bridegroom is responsible for this. And now they've ran out of wine. So this is an embarrassing situation. This is an embarrassing situation for the family. And it's possible since Mary was invited, Jesus was invited, and they were cool with him bringing five extra guys that were not on the invite list, that Jesus was actually a family. This belonged to their extended family. And so Mary's concerned here, and she turns to Jesus, and she doesn't even ask him a question. It says she just says to him, they have no wine. And and I've seen this sort of like portrayed in different ways. You know, did she say they have no wine? Like, Jesus, you need to do something about it. It doesn't say that. I think it's more likely she just said it. She just said they have no wine. They've run out. Now, Jesus here is being set up for the first of the seven or eight signs in the Gospel of John that talk about who he is and as God, who he is as Savior, and what he has control over. But Mary doesn't know this. 
Jesus has never actually performed a miraculous sign yet that she's been able to witness. This has not happened yet. This is the very first one. We see that in verse 11. This is the first of his signs. So she didn't say they have no wine expecting him to do something miraculous because she would not have known that. Now, she does know that, that uh, Jesus was the promised son to her. She was a, he was a son of promise that an angel came and told her what his purpose was going to be, that he would be called Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. <clears throat> and so she, she understands the miraculous nature of who he is. So it's not unlikely for her to have expected him to do something extraordinary, but she's never witnessed it before. Now, what may be possible is that if she knew anybody that probably knew the right thing to do in a given situation, it was probably Jesus. So she may have been used to being able to say, there's a problem. And Jesus go, well, this is how we ought to solve it, the right way. So she just, she just kind of says out loud, we have no wine. And then Jesus says something that people get flustered by. I'm talking like us people, like in, in our day and age. When we read this, people get flustered by the next thing that Jesus says. Luke, are you still with us? Luke, can you, can you read for us? Yeah. Read for me verses 4 and 5 of John chapter 2. All right, I'm going to boot up my phone real quick here. Here we go. All right. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Very good. So, first of all, we got this word, this word, woman. That's not how we talk to our moms these days. <laughs> All right. If I talked to my mom that way, I'd get a whooping. All right. Like now I'd get a whooping. I don't talk to my mom like that, but Jesus just did. And then he says something even a little, it's just, it still sounds rude. He says, what does that have to do with me? Okay. Now if my son talked to me that way or to his mother that way, I'd be a little flustered with him too. Okay. He might get a whooping from me. So what do we do with that? Now, there are some translations that will leave this word out, that will change the word to make it sound nicer in our more, in our, in our more modern language. But that's not good because the word used here was woman. And John's been so careful to transcribe the actual words used and even in some cases translate them after for our Greek listeners, if it was like a Hebrew word, so like in John chapter 1, when last week when we were talking about when they said rabbi, and then in parentheses, he immediately says, which means teacher. So we know that John is trying to accurately capture the words here, and so it's appropriate for us to have this translated woman, because that's what it said. But this was not a term of rudeness for him to use for his mother. This was a term of endearment. This was a term of compassion that when we look at even um, text, other extra biblical texts written in that day, that a man would have referred to a woman respectfully by just saying woman. So it was totally respectful for him to say that. Um, it's the same way that he addresses her on the cross when he says, woman, behold your son, pointing to John. And, and basically he's, he's commissioning John, the evangelist, to take over the role of caring for his mother now that he can no longer do it. He addresses her as woman in that instance. When he talks to Mary Magdalene, whom he had a very compassionate relationship to uh, later on in his ministry, he uses the same word woman to talk to her. So we don't see this as being a rude thing. Um, and so since that's the case, we don't need to translate it any different way. If you've got a translation that doesn't say woman there, um, They've just taken some poetic license with it. They're, they're sort of changing it up to make sure we don't offend anybody. That's not really good. It's good to stick with what the text originally said. So he says, woman, what does that have to do? What does this have to do with me? And in the Greek, it says um, it's, it's together. It's with 
me and with you. So some of, some of our translations will say, what does it have to do with you? What does this have to do with me? Uh, the King James is even worse. It says, what do you have to do with me? Which is, <laughs> that's, that's even harder for us to understand. But what he's <laughs> trying to say here is that, you know, mom, this isn't our responsibility. Like there's people here whose job it is to take care of this problem. And I, and I kind of gather from the fact that you brought it up that you might want me to have done something about it, but we got to remember we're guests here. So why don't we let somebody else decide what we should do about it? And so then he follows up to make sure she doesn't misunderstand. He says, my hour has not yet come. What does that refer to? My hour has not yet come. <clears throat> He's referring to the manifestation of who he is as Messiah. Good, good. That's one, that's one thing that I've seen in the commentary, that, it, that, it's, um, that it's his sort of revealing of himself, and who he right. is as Messiah. What he's capable of. Yep. Some, some might say his hour is like when he dies on the cross. Okay. Like his sacrificial death. <clears throat> A lot of times that we see the hour, when he talks about my hour is coming, or an hour is coming, he's talking about that moment when he dies on the cross for our sins. Um, and that, that's, his, that's like the fulfillment of his work of salvation right there. And so I, I would say it kind of either one of these is fine. What he's trying to communicate to her is that there is a timetable that has been decided since eternity past. That God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit make a covenant amongst themselves to do a work of salvation on this earth. And that there's a timetable that's already decided. And that timetable is not driven by her. Now, she's a good mom. And so she probably likes to push her children. All right? And at the same time, however, she's just like I am, where there's things that God has ordained to happen, and I either think that God's being too slow about it, or I think that God's not being, or, or being too quick about it. But either way, since it's not on my timetable, I'm mad at that. I, I get frustrated by that, and I think God should work on my schedule. You know, when I want healing, I want it now. When I um, when I want to, uh, this happens a lot to me. When I want to serve God, I want to do it later. Okay? That's not something we usually admit. But that happens to me a lot. Uh, there's things God calls me to do. This lesson is one of them. Honestly, I did not even have plans to do this. It was Ben that said, we should do this. And I was like, uh, okay, he's right. But I was, to I was totally not going to do this. I was just going to record the one at work and send it to you guys and be lazy. And we would miss out on this opportunity to now fellowship together live in person over within the word of God. And so I, this is me admitting sin. That was sin in me. There was good that I should have known to do. And I didn't do it. And so thank you, Ben, um, for, for challenging ben. me. I'll, I'll, um, I owe you an extra hug later <laughs> for, for challenging me. So, yeah, so this is, he's sort of, he's, he's not really, he's pushing back on her it's a gentle compassionate pushing back on her it's more of a reminder that god doesn't work on her timetable and i think she she gets that she doesn't fight him she doesn't argue with him what is her response to him she doesn't give him a response it doesn't seem like <clears throat> well she yeah she doesn't respond back to him who does she talk to instead <clears throat> the servants she tells the servants <clears throat> she says servants do whatever he tells you and so there's a sense here in which she still understands from his response that he's still going to do something about it <clears throat> now it almost it almost seems like she's in a she's has an attitude of submission to whatever it is he decides to do, whether it's nothing or something. Right. Whatever he tells you to do, 
then do that. I'm not going to drive it. I'm going to let him take charge and, and handle it. Now, remember we said that um, it's, it's not necessary that she would have expected something miraculous. So for example, if the problem is, if, if you came to a wedding today, they ran out of wine, what would be the solution to that? Go get more wine and bring it to the wedding, okay? Well, that, if Jesus had done that, he would have probably needed servants to go help him. So even though she asks the servants to do whatever he tells you, that doesn't necessarily mean that she's expecting something miraculous. She's just asking them to, to obey, help him. He's going to need some help solving this problem. So then we get a little bit of setting. In verse 6, it says, Now there were six stone, jar, stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Uh oh my whiteboard's running off. Each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So, Scott, is that like for like their, like the, ceremonial cleansing stuff like the, when the Jews were trying to become clean is that what that purification water is I don't really know what that is. no this was for them to wash their hands gotcha so it's the people in that day did not wash their hands as a means by as a means to get rid of germs you know now now the president of the United States gets on the TV and says everybody wash your hands for 20 seconds but today like back then that was only something that was prescribed by law. Hmm. So there were six, I'm gonna to try to draw six stone jars here. They're beautiful. These are stick figure jars. And each one of these holding 20 or 30. And so if you, um, and it, we can see examples of this in the other gospels that, you know, one of the complaints that the Pharisees had with Jesus' disciples was that they didn't always wash their hands before they ate. Sometimes they just ate. And Jesus was going, Jesus, you know, corrected them and said, you know, you, you're sort of like stacking onto the law of God, your traditions, and you're missing the point of the law. You're missing the, what the law meant. So here, these were just, these were just large jars of water that were used to wash their hands. Now they're made of stone because what does stone not do that other materials do? Absorb. It doesn't absorb and it doesn't sweat. So they're non-porous, I guess is what we should talk about here. And that was a big deal to them. So if you've got a problem, if you're washing your hands for cleanness reasons, and let's say these were earthen jars, they were made of pottery, you put water in a pottery jar and some of the grit from the pottery gets in there and you can kind of tell it's not clean. So if it's stone, that's more commonly used for rites of purification so that the water is visibly observably clean they also had concerns about things going through barriers and and this is totally extra biblical i have a friend at an old job who was jewish and one of the things that he tried to explain to me was that one of their interpretations of some of the laws in the old testament was that things aren't supposed to cross boundaries so he wouldn't shake hands for example through a doorway you either needed to come on one side of the doorway or he would go on the other but you didn't do it through the doorway. And, mm -hmm. and that's why they kept their foods in separate bowls. And here the non-porousness of stone would have prevented the water from sort of um, sweating out because that would be an unclean thing. So this is just a Jewish thing for us to understand. So that's where they are. There's six stone jars. And Jesus says to the servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. So they fill them. And I'm going to draw this picture. There's water up to the brim. So if there's water up to the brim, what else is in the jars? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Just water. This isn't water plus something else. It wasn't a trick where I made something that looked like wine, or maybe there was some wine that somebody poured in the jar. No, they filled the whole jars up to the brim with water, 20 to 30 gallons. So we're looking at between 120 and um, 180 gallons total of water. It probably took them a little bit of time to move that much water. So they fill them to the brim, and he says to them in verse 8, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So when we think about weddings today, it's, sometimes we have a person that's called a wedding planner, 
And that wedding planner can sort of act like the boss man or the boss lady for the event. We had a wedding planner. We also had a caterer. And um, they both thought they were in charge mm. at our wedding. And that led to all sorts of, of um, to angst as they fought over what was supposed to be happening at the wedding. Um, but this master of the feast in the Greek, it is master of three tables. That's what the word means, literally. And so the tradition here is that at a given event, um, it, people in that day that didn't sit upright like this at a table, like we, like we do, like I'm sitting right here, they would sort of lounge on couches next to the table. And if there was a large enough group, they would put three of those tables together. So I'm gonna sort of just, you know, three tables together like this. And they would lounge on their couches around the outside like this. And there would be a servant whose job was to serve them. And he would be positioned sort of here in the center. That would be his job. He was the master of three tables. Well, over time, especially as events grew larger, you might have a lot of these groupings um, all around the room, lots of three table groups, but the head of all the servants would be called this name, master of three tables. He was, he was the head of the servants. He was not head of the guests, head of the servants. One of his jobs was to taste the food, to taste the wine, to make sure everything was just right. So if you've ever watched um, Downton Abbey, all right, I, there, this is a men's class, so I know some of you are not gonna be, um, you're gonna be too ashamed to say that you watched Downton Abbey, but there's a guy named Carson, he's the head butler. One of his jobs was to taste the wine to make sure it was a crust before it went out to, the, to the, the lords and ladies. So that's sort of the same kind of position. So they draw this water out and they take it to the master of the feast they took it. And in verse 9, the master of the feast tasted the water, and look what it says here, now become wine. Now, there's a, there's a question here that comes up. You know what the question is? Some people ask the question, when did the water become wine? Did it become wine when they put the water in? Did it become wine while it was in there? Did it become wine after they drew it out? And that's a wine glass. <laughs> but, uh, guess what? It doesn't say. And if it doesn't say, it doesn't matter. That's, that's, a, that's sort of hard for us to, to swallow. <laughs> I bring it up because I read two different commentators that had very different opinions on this. One that said, if Jesus was at this wedding, then that would mean that the people who were getting married were very holy people. And because they were very holy people, then they would not have been drinking very much at all. So that means that if he turned any water into wine, it would have only been this little cup. And that way, he didn't produce 180 gallons of wine for people to get drunk with. This was the reasoning. It doesn't say that. And Jesus hung out with drunk people all the time. He hung out with sinners and publicans and prostitutes. There's not a requirement here that the people that are getting married are necessarily righteous people. That's not a requirement. If we continue to read... Um, there's also, I tell you what, we'll just keep going. It doesn't, I, the point I wanted to make was, it says water now become wine. It doesn't matter where it was. If it was 180 gallons of wine or one cup, it doesn't matter. The miracle was still the same. Mm -hmm. I think it's unlikely that he would say, fill up six stone jars with 180 gallons of water, and then I'm going to produce one cup of wine to solve this problem. That's a little unlikely. Mm -hmm. I think his mother would have been a little, okay, that's a miracle, but you didn't solve the problem. I, I think here he's using the problem as an opportunity to solve it and display his glory, to manifest his glory. Uh, if I may. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> an, another manifestation of the account being given this way is that the jars were filled to the brim with water, right? Right. 
that means that there can be no possibility of having water in there that's, or wine in there that's watered down. He's produced six stone jars of wine. There can be no question that what happened there was a miracle. Right. And if, he's, and if John's recording a miracle for us, and one of them had, if it had been weak wine, he'd have told us. If it had been uh, one of them was wine and the rest of them were water, I can't help but think that he would have told us. Mm -hmm. John's point here is that the, the magnitude of the miracle was such that it could not be denied. It couldn't be mistaken, yeah. That Jesus produced the finest wine that was presented at that wedding. That's what made it a miracle, such a miracle. Yep. Very good. Thank Scott, you. Can I ask you a question, Scott? Sure. So I was just wondering, do you think, do you think, because Jesus, he, he doesn't really say much in this whole process, right? So I, I find it interesting that he talks about his hour not yet coming. And I was just wondering, do you think because of, you know, the symbolism that he uses like at the Last Supper with, with th this, this is my blood poured out for you when he passes the wine around? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any, and I might be looking too much into this, but do you think this could be Jesus, the, like his first declaration of what he's going to do at the cross? It is. It is. And we're going to get to that. So that's, that's good that you asked that question. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So there's, um, I wanted to get through sort of like the mechanics here and then talk about what this symbolizes as a whole. Gotcha. We got to be careful with symbols like that, but we, we do get a lot of good word pictures in the Bible, things that consistently point to something specific. Mm -hmm. And so there's some symbols here that I think we can easily reach for and feel confident in. Okay. And so, yeah, we'll definitely talk about those. So he, he's, he's drawn, they've drawn out the water and they took it to the master of the feast, the master of three tables. And he tastes it and does not know where it came from. In parentheses, though, the servants who had drawn the water knew. So that means they didn't tell him. They just brought it to him. That was their job. Before wine is served uh, that's from a new source, you take it to the master of the feast to make sure that it tastes good. And he, he has an immediate reaction. He does not turn to them and make a comment. He takes that wine and goes to somebody. Who is it? It doesn't bridegroom. go to Jesus. Goes to the bridegroom. Goes to the bridegroom. bridegroom. Yeah, so the master goes to the bridegroom and says, dude, um, this is not how we normally do things. He says, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. This drunk freely does not mean necessarily intoxicated. So we're not going to wait till everybody's drunk and then serve them the cheap stuff. It just means when they've all had an opportunity to be satisfied with the wine. Then the party's going to continue on and we can drink some of the weaker stuff and it's okay. But that, that's sort of a first impressions thing. We serve the good wine first, so everybody, you know, first impressions, and then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And there, this, is, this is yet another sign that what Jesus has done is miraculous. So one of the things my dad mentioned was that this wasn't watered down wine. This wasn't cheap wine. This was the best wine that they had tasted yet at the event. And so it elicits this immediate reaction from the master of the feast. He goes, wait, this, if I'd have known this was here, I'd have served this first. And it's been my job to run this show correctly. And he goes to the bridegroom and basically fusses him out for it. <laughs> it guy, dude, you've trusted me and you've been hiding this somewhere. I'm supposed to be running this the right way so that you don't have to. And so we know from his reaction, this was really good wine. Uh, what, so one commentator that I read said that it, it was not uncommon then for Ed, when they drank wine for it to be watered down, that it was safer to drink water in that time to do it that way. 
and that new wine was very strong and would have made you intoxicated much more quickly. And so like in, uh, in the book of Acts, when Peter and the other uh, apostles are at Pentecost and they begin speaking in tongues and one of the complaints, one of the accusations that's given is that they're drunk with new wine. In other words, they've been drinking the strong stuff. And so there's a sense here that that's sort of what he's talking about here. He's talking about new wine. He's talking about the really, well, this is fantastic. This is the good stuff. And so we know that this is a miracle as a result. And so it's, it's obvious. It is plain to everybody who's been privy to the source of this wine. His mother knew what happened. The disciples have watched this happen. The servants who were there drew the water out of the jars they just worked to fill up. They're the only ones who know this. Who else at this party knew that this is how this went down? Does it say? Is there anybody else who knows that this is where the wine came from? Oh, the servants. The servants did. Yeah, so we've got, we've got Mary, we've got the disciples, and the servants. And we don't know how many servants there were, but there were only five disciples at this point, at most, who have showed up. Is this a large crowd of people to have seen his first miracle? No. Th this, is sort of, this is sort of like how Jesus was born in a little town called Bethlehem, in a stable. He wasn't born in a palace. His birth was not announced to the world. A very small group of people saw it. And here, this is his first miracle. It happens at a family wedding, and a very small group of people, even at the wedding, are privy to it. I mean, if, if he's the Messiah, if he's the, the prophet, priest, and king, prophesied by Moses and David and all of the prophets to come, and especially the Jews expected a military leader, they expected a a. a someone who would become king of the Jews and lead a temporal kingdom, you would think that a man like that would just roar out onto the scene. I mean, he would come riding out on his white horse. People would be following him with pitchforks, and they would drive the Romans out. And that is not at all what happens here. Here he does a very clear, obvious miracle, but only a few people are privy to it. Scott, do you think it's possible that the, the real crux of the message here is what he provided was the best and he chose to, he chose to show it to the most lowly people in the home, just like the more lowly people is who his birth was announced to? Uh, that's possible. I mean, because, you know, it doesn't say that there was a king there who tasted the wine and, and knew that Jesus made it or anything like that. He, it is to the most lowly people. I mean, his disciples were fishermen, uh, they, and his, his mother is now a, probably a widow at this point, and, you know, widows were, were not high-class citizens um, in that respect. And so, yeah, absolutely. This is, him, this is him going out publicly with his first event in his ministry, but it's only to the most lowly of people. Absolutely. So now, he's done a miracle. He has performed a sign. And miracles and signs always have the same purpose. Now, I'm going to say, I'm say this is, that's very superlative, okay? But the purpose of a miracle in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, we see this happen. The purpose of a miracle is to... Prove the authority of the person who performed it. And this authority is not necessarily by their own design. This may be that they were sent from God and that that's the authority that they've been given. So when we see Jesus perform miracles, when we see um, Peter and uh, Peter perform a miracle, when he, you know, heals the lame man at the gate, um, when we, uh, when we see, let's see, I'll say to prove the authority or to bring glory to the one who performed it. So miracles 
their, their purpose is very specific. It, God grants the ability to do these miracles to men to prove that they, the, that the words they say have authority. Um, when Jesus does a miracle, it's to prove something about himself. And here it says that, that this first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and by doing so, they manifested his glory. The purpose for his miracle was for what happens at the end of verse 11. At the end of verse 11, it says, and his disciples believed in him. That they believed in him. You write that down. You think that's why John seems to always refer to him as signs. He doesn't refer to him as miracles. He does. He's, he's, he's emphasizing the significance of the miracle itself and how it came about by the power of Christ as opposed to the miracle, what we would call the miracle itself. Right. The miracle itself is a neat thing, but it's what it points to that is important. And so signs, you know, when we see my dad, raise your hand, my dad's a sign guy, signs communicate or point to something. You know, when you drive down the road, there's a street sign. It tells you if you go this way, you're on this street. It'll take you this direction. You go in a doctor's office and you need to see a specific doctor. It'll have an arrow that points that way. A sign points to something. Here he's performed a miracle. John's calling it a sign because it points to something. And it points to his glory, to his power. And um, we're going to see other examples of his power over creation. But I would say this points to his creative power. Now, God created the world ex nihilo, which is Latin for out of nothing. This is not an out of nothing transformation, but it is a transformation that there is a, there is a creative transformative power that Jesus has. And he has it divinely. It, it's not like um, if I was to create something, I'd go out and transform the dirt into a garden by digging and shoveling and, and doing all of those things. No, he didn't touch the water. He didn't even say anything over the water. He didn't wave his hands over the water. He just said, fill it up, draw it out, and take it to the master of the feast. And divinely, hey, his God, power... let me ask you... Go ahead. A quick question. Chapter 2, verse 1. What's the significance of the first phrase, on the third day? Sure. So, um, on the third day... Uh, if this is sort of calling back to the timeline that we're in here at the beginning of John. In John chapter 1, there were four days in a row that are recounted. It's got, it has the, the first right. testimony of John. Then on 29, it says the next day. Then in 35, it says the next day. Then in 43, it says the next day. So we've got four days there. And then it says on the third day. Well, it's, it's, it's likely, I would say most probable, that that's talking about now the seventh day. So we had four days and then the seventh day, which lines up with how long it would have taken for him to get from Bethany to Cana. It's about a three days journey uh, in that day. And so he's, he's on his way into Galilee, receives the invitation, and goes to the wedding and arrives there on that third day. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I get it. I was just looking at, at the whole miracle, wondering if that has any tie-in for future events being as it related to the resurrection. But I, I'm having a hard time putting that together. Yeah. But I just noticed that this, the term third day um, is used all over the place, but it's normally typically used in line with, with the resurrection. So right. I was just curious if there was any symbolism that, anyone has ever looked at from a commentary perspective that would have any of that time. Here, um, I think it's just a, a note about the timeline. There are other references that Jesus makes to the three days that he would spend in the grave. He's, he talks about the sign of Jonah. Um, when, he's, when he clears out the temple, which is what we're going to talk about next week, and they challenge him for it, he says, destroy this temple, and he's talking about his own body. And then three days, I will, I will raise it up. Those examples of three days do point to the three days that he spent in the grave. But this one, I think, is just timeline. 
that's all it was. But that's a good question. Can, can you, uh, you know, what I find interesting is when you start looking at 20 to 30 gallons of water, if you use the 30 gallons, it works out about 1,500 pounds of water in six pots. And you start looking at that and you ask yourself, how long did it take them to actually fill the jars to begin with? You know, the way oh. the verse reads, oh, they just went out, picked it up, and off they went. Those, those pots, without the stone weight, weighed 200, almost 250 pounds apiece with 30 gallons of water in it. Right. So these weren't pots that they could pick up and go somewhere with them. Somebody had to tote the water to fill them up, or they had to have multiple people picking them up to begin with. Yeah. I mean, in the past, when I've read this story, just reading through and the way we get water today, I, in my mind, it's been like they got out the garden hose and filled up six stone jars, and they just kind of sat there like this, filling it up. But you're right. That's not what they did. They would have had to carry this water. They didn't have running water in houses. So yeah, that would have taken some time and some effort. It took a while just to get the pots filled. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, um, Ben, to your question. Um, we see two, and I'm gonna say imageries here, two examples of imagery that lead us to seeing this as a symbolic thing. One is these six stone jars. So I've got six stone jars here, and what was their purpose? Originally, to hold water for purification. To hold water for purification. And so we see here an example of the Jewish law, that this was as prescribed by law, that they were to wash their hands. And he takes this, he takes, he takes their purpose, and now he introduces another element that's used mm -hmm. elsewhere in his ministry, and that is of wine. And where else did we see wine used in an important way in his, in his ministry? Supper. At the Last Supper. And what does he call it? Blood. It's blood. This is my blood of the covenant. This is the new covenant. And so the old jars point to the old covenant hmm. and the wine is now pointing to the new covenant and in a in an observer of what's going on at this event as somebody who's been made privy to what really happened those that believed in him are are getting to watch now the transformation the, the this transition period from the old covenant to the new covenant as it is now being established. Jesus is ushering in the new covenant. His presence and his ministry as he begins it is ushering that in. That's the symbolism that, that, that we can, I think, confidently lay claim to here. You know, I just thought it was kind of interesting. It doesn't say in here that he told them to empty the water first. So it makes it seem like he would, they would just add it. You know, these guys were in there washing their hands and all that junk in the in the jars, and he just they just add water to it, and he makes it perfect anyway. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't say how much water was in there that it was used for washing hands. Um, I read one commentator that said they were probably empty because we're three days into a wedding. There you go. Um, I I don't know. It doesn't say that. So uh, like I kind of it could have been some pretty nasty water, like technically, because they've been washing their hands. I, I, I would have thought that they would have. You know, you're entering a home to eat at a banquet and you've got servants. Now there's a lot of details about that particular incident we don't know, but one of the things that's common uh, within the gospels is that you arrive at a home and you have a servant to wash people's feet and to wash people's hands before they go in to eat. They're probably not gonna be dunking their hands and feet into the jars, but rather dipping out of the jars and pouring it oh because you, you've seen the movies where they pour it over their hands and there's a certain way they do it because it's a it's a ritual purification before they go in to eat yeah so i i can see where the water in the jars wouldn't necessarily be dirty per se as much as the fact that whether it had any water in there or not when they went out to get all the water and fill the jars up 
you're back to the observation I made earlier, and that is there can just be no, there can be no watering down of that if the um, master of the tables thought it was the best wine he'd had all night. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Cool. Well, so that sort of that sort of wraps up the accounting of the wedding and the first sign, and then we get this transition sentence. And we're going to see a lot of these transition sentences in the Gospel of John, where people have been in one sort of scene, and John is now going to transition into the next one. We're going to talk about the next scene later, uh, next week. But verse 12 here, um, it says, and his disciples believed in him. And then in verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So this is just a transition for them to get from the wedding at Cana to then at, at some point, he's going to go up into Jerusalem for the Passover. And that's when he's going to cleanse the temple. So we're going to study that um, next week. But what I wanted us to note here is that we don't know his brothers were at present at this wedding until verse 12. So gathered around him was not just his mother and his disciples, but also his brothers were there. So his entire immediate family would have witnessed this first of his miracles. These were people that grew up with him. Uh, two of them, um, which are James and Judas, Jude, not Judas, James and Jude, end up becoming important figures in the New Testament church, leaders in the church at Jerusalem. And they end up both writing books that end up in the Bible. But they've grown up with Jesus, and they've never seen him perform a miracle. And now he shows up at this wedding with five uninvited disciples. The wine runs out, and Mary sort of says in Jesus' direction, the wine's run out. She didn't say that to any of her other children. They're probably used to him being a goody-goody. And now he actually does a miracle that they cannot deny. And I'd be hard-pressed to, to think that they didn't also believe in him at this point. Because they've now witnessed it. They've probably heard Mary talk about the miraculous birth of Christ. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay. But now Jesus has performed a miracle. And they were there to witness it. I think that's neat. And, and, but we don't get a hint of that until verse 12 there. So we, don't, we can't like skip over it and jump right into the next scene. That's why John includes it. So now they all travel together. Um, and they're following him. And Capernaum is sort of like on the way to Jerusalem. So like the next step is Jerusalem. That's where we'll end up next week. There, if I may, uh, it, it, of all the times I've covered this material, it's, it's never really occurred to me until tonight um, something that may be obvious to other people, and that is... John's, John is giving us a lot of theology in these 12 verses, but he's doing it by telling a story that includes any number of people who are not the point of the story. They're not, they're not main figures. They're not the high priest. They're not the, the, the demoniac. <coughs> They're just folks. And as he, uh, and, and so what he's done is he just tells a story. What, what if this was just a story? Well, it's a good story. It's an interesting thing that John has done to bring these people in. The funny thing about it is it's true. And, and the truth of the story can almost be something that hits you on the backside rather than on the front side. Um, uh, we've got him going down to a wedding. We've got him having a conversation with his mother. We've got his mother giving the servants instructions. This is all stuff of stories. I mean, you, you, someone could write a play or someone could write um, a movie 
and have this scene in it and it be a scene that tacks onto something for the rest of the movie. But here it becomes a major point of introduction between him and what he's going to be doing for the rest of the gospel. And uh, uh, that's a, you know, there was no script for the master of the tables. There was no script for the servants. There was, there was no script for his disciples. They walked in and this played out. And when he walked out, he was a miracle worker and lives were beginning to be changed. When we tell it as a story, think about it for a minute. I, you know, if you've read, and I, and I haven't read much, but if, if you read things like the Quran, the Book of Mormon, so much of the time, they just make claims about things. They just make claims. Well, isn't it interesting that he didn't make a single claim here? All he did was tell the story. And we get to see the claim from the story that was told. Yep. And what that does is that puts us in a position of having a wonderful defense against naysayers. Because naysayers want to come along and give us a lot of objections to the things that they see here. But they can't find a person who's been paid behind the scenes to do this, that, or the other. All these people are in their, in, in their activity and through their just common actions and responses, we get the miracle that's been poured out for us. That's, that's something that you can dwell on for a while so that your foundation, the rock under your feet, is more solid than it was. Very good. Very good. Well, we've we've run a full hour, which is great, and and we didn't even spend like the whole time getting Zoom connected or anything like that. Um, so that's worked very well. Does anybody have any other questions or comments or things before we wrap up? <clears throat> Just thanks for putting it together, Scott. Appreciate it. Well, thanks to you for kicking me in the butt and making me do it. Uh, this is this is a good thing. Yeah. Now something's changed on my screen, Scott. What what's happened here? Oh, I turned off screen share so that it's just us. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I did hit record. Um, I will um, upload this to YouTube. That's what I've been doing with recordings. And then I'll just hit reply all on that email that I sent out to invite everybody to it and and send you guys links to the video. And that way everybody's got a link. If you want to rewatch it, if you've got friends that you that, that want to watch it, for those of you who called in by phone and couldn't see the, the actual video part, my stick figures are top notch and it's well worth watching if you do get some time. So um, <laughs> thanks to all of you who called in and especially those of you at Dellinger Park, that's, that's great. I've never taught remotely to a, to an open air location, so that's neat. Hey, uh, uh, Ben, About, uh, no. doing that too. I'm yeah, sorry, right now. somebody. Go ahead, Luke. I said there's about nine of us here. Wow. Right now. So yeah. is this, what, what group is this? I feel like I heard Mike Loy's voice. You heard Mike Loy's voice. He's, um, I mean, he's always instigating stuff. <laughs> so this is the, uh, Young Singles Ministry, a subset of that group. So okay. Some brands. This is not an official. Cool. Related to that. Very cool. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, and wrap up. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, hey, Ben. Sir. This, this is all your fault. So why don't you close us in prayer? <laughs> sure will. I sure will. All right. Uh, dear my Father, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for how you've opened doors for us to, to bless each other and grow closer, even when we're not in the same place, which is really hard to kind of wrap your head around sometimes. But I just 
I thank you that, that we, 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 can, we can take what you've shown us and use it for good. And I just, uh, I pray that you'd bless, bless Scott for his commitment to doing this when he didn't have to do that. And, and I thank you for his, his, his obedience and willingness to do that. I thank you for all the other guys that, that came in and, and uh, were able to share things and, and provide insight on this, this, this amazing story. And I just, I thank you, Father, that, uh, that you did shed your blood for us and that you, you cover our sins and that we can, we can have you know, eternity with you because of that sacrifice. And I thank you for this first glimpse of it uh, here with the miracle at Canaan. And I just, uh, I just pray that you would keep everyone safe. I, I pray for all, anyone that's struggling with, you know, with not feeling well and, and just pray that uh, they would they'd have good recoveries and full recoveries. I, I pray that, that you would put your hand on this country and that you would – you would you would put your hand on on slowing and stopping the, the spread of this virus that's going around, Father. And I just uh, I just hope that pray, I pray that you would help us to just continue to put things in perspective and to, and to know that you're in charge and everything happens according to your will, and that you will protect us in a way that you see fit. And I just I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for allowing us to get glimpses of that on on a daily basis. I thank you again for all your many blessings. In your name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Scott.